Testaments to the book of Ephesians, please. Book of Ephesians in chapter 6. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 10. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Now, Paul wrote this to Christians. The Christian life is, is a blessed life. It's full of wonderful joys. It's full of triumphs. It's full of, uh, of happiness. It's full of peace. But the Christian life is not without its problems. And Paul here is warning the Ephesians, and through them he is, he is warning all believers that the devil is actively scheming against you. He wants to win you over. He wants to drag you down. He wants all of who you are. And Paul describes this as a struggle. It's, it's, a, it's a fight, as Mo prayed about. It's a, it's a wrestling match. And he has many schemes that he tries to find weak spots in our armor. And today we want to talk about just general discouragement and how he can, he can try to beat us down just by discouraging us through worry and through endless varieties of, of anxiety. Let's not give the devil too much credit. He doesn't know everything about us, but he does know what causes us to worry. And once he finds out what causes us to worry, he's going to attack us on that front. And some people are just prone to, to, to worry. They're prone to anxiety. And this, this is where Satan, if this is you, me, this is where Satan is going to press you. This is where Satan is going to actively scheme against you. Not openly, not with red eyes, a pitchfork, and devil horns, but he's going to do it subtly pulling the levers behind the curtain. And we're speaking today in the realm of the cares of this world. We're talking about the Martha type, what Rachel calls a, a nervous Nelly, someone who is troubled, someone who is distracted with many, many things, perfectly legitimate things, things that are not wrong in and of themselves to give attention to, children, putting food on the table, your bills, your job, your health, your education, the direction of your life, all of these things, perfectly legitimate things. The devil wants to take those things. He wants to wrap them up and make them a burden so heavy that it crowds out all of the spiritual thoughts in your hearts and in your minds until the main focus in your life ceases to be spiritual at all. And now all of a sudden Jesus has no room in your heart. And so his aim is, is very simple. He's been, he's been playing by the same playbook for, since Genesis chapter 3. Take the focus away from God. That's all he has to do. Take the focus away from God. Classic example is Matthew chapter 14. You remember the, the disciples are on the boat and there is a storm that arises. And, and, and they're fearful uh, that, that they're going to die. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. Peter says, if it's you, Lord... Command me to step out of this boat. He says, it's me. Come, come forth. Step out. And Peter does with faith. He steps out of the boat onto water. And he stands atop the water. And he's looking at Jesus. And so far as he's looking at Jesus, he's able to walk on that water. It's an illustration of what's going on in our hearts. But then what happened? What did Peter notice? The waves. He started looking at those waves and he got scared. And the minute he started focusing on the problems around him, what happened? He started to sink. Jesus has to pick him up. Oh, ye of little faith, you know the story. That's a picture of what's going on in our lives. So long as we focus on Jesus, so long as we keep our eyes on Him, 
Brethren, we can walk on water spiritually. But, but we often don't do that. We often put so much attention and so much focus on circumstances, on our problems, and the frequency with which Jesus addresses this very issue in our lives about worry and, and anxiety is telling. So it's not just a problem I have and you have. This is a problem that, that we've always had, even 2,000 years ago in the ancient world. You know the parable of the sower over there in, in Luke chapter 8. Go over there to Luke chapter 8. You remember that the, the seed is the Word of God there, and it's planted in the heart, and the heart is, consists of different soils that accepts that seed or that rejects it. But the danger is not always the devil swooping in like a, like a bird and stealing that seed right away immediately. There's, there's another type of person here in Luke 8 and verse 14. He says, The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. So the thorns are representative of, of the, the, the issues of life that, that reach around and that are growing up with that plant and they choke it out so that we cannot be the people that God has created us to be. A more solemn warning that's paired with a prophetic judgment is found in Luke chapter 21, if you want to turn over there. Luke chapter 21, in verse 34, Jesus says there, Be on guard! so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and what else? The worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Very similar to Paul's words in Ephesians. He's saying the same kind of thing. He's repeating this principle. The cares of this world are legitimate cares, and they, they deserve our attention, but they can utterly deceive us. They can distract us. They can weigh us down. They, they can turn our focus away, and when you think about it, it's absolutely ridiculous that a bill could do this. It's ridiculous that our health could do this. That these, these, these things in the grand scheme of things, yes, they seem big now, but, but in the grand scheme of things, they're very small. And they, they distract us from the reality and the certainty uh, of the impending meeting that we have with God. We're going to see God face to face, and we've got to be ready for it. And we can't waste our lives worrying and being anxious about these things. And so we want to be extremely practical today. Very basic lesson. I'm going to give you three things uh, that, that we can do. We'll look at some examples of that, and then we'll get very specific at the end. So uh, I encourage you to pay attention. Um, this is something that, that's helped me, and uh, I've actually preached this lesson before, and I feel like I need it again. Maybe, maybe you do too. So first of all, what do we do when, when we begin to notice that we're worrying and we're anxious and we've got issues in our life that are, that are beginning to push Jesus away. What do we do? Well, first of all, recognize the hand of the devil. Would you do that? Recognize who, who is pulling the levers. This is all important. This is the first step. Like Peter walking on that water, we tend to focus on the problem, the outward circumstance, and we fail to see the hand who's pulling the lever. That's that dirty snake. That's the liar. That's the cheater. That's the murderer. That's Satan, the dragon. And he's behind the scenes pulling the lever. If you could, if you could begin there, then we have a, a base point. Then we have a foundation. Recognize the hand of the devil and then reprimand yourself. Reprimand yourself because you know better. <laughs> This is something that this is very hard. Why should we reprimand ourselves? Because Christians never have a right to be bent out of shape and to be agitated. We have no business, brethren, wasting our time and our energy with worry and anxiety because that attitude is inconsistent with our King Jesus and what He came to free us from. 
Christians should never be out of control because Jesus, our namesake, the one we wear, Christian, the one who, who dwells and reigns in our hearts, He was never out of control. And we have the same mind. As Paul says to the Philippians, have this mind, have this attitude in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now there he's talking about humility. But he goes on to talk about how he, he endured suffering. He endured the death of the cross and he did it. And all the while he was in control. When worry comes, ask why. Why, why is this troubling me? And, and reprimand yourself. Doesn't, doesn't my faith in the conquering King, in the Lamb of God, doesn't it count for anything? Why have I allowed the devil to trick me again? You, you ever do that? It's the same thing all the time. He's been beating the dead horse all the time. It's the same old tired routine. The devil's scheme is easy. It's to so fully crowd and, and blind your mind with the circumstances and the situations of this life in order to paralyze us with the unfounded fear of the unknown. It's no new tricks. He's got the same playbook since Genesis chapter 3. And by the way, the devil's playbook is empty. There are no plays in it. It's whatever you want to do. And this is what he presents before us. But it's the same thing. It's the same return. So recognize who is pulling the lever, reprimand ourselves, and then realize our need for self-discipline. Realize our need for self-discipline. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Now Paul isn't talking about being a Roman centurion. He's talking about the, the spiritual army that you and I are a part of. The, the putting on the armor of God and, and Jesus our King and our Commander. He is leading forth the charge. He's on the white horse. His, out of His mouth comes the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and, and with it He conquers His enemies through peace and through sacrifice and through love. He's the one who enlisted us. And so we must not uh, entangle ourselves like that seed that was entangled by those thorns and the cares and the affairs of everyday life. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Do you see how he was disciplining himself? He realized the need for self-discipline. That's the cure for this, it's to, to, to discipline ourselves. That, and that doesn't, as we, as we looked at self-control and the fruit of the Spirit, we realized that doesn't come on us like a miraculous wave, and you know, we're just imbued with that uh, in a miraculous way, and God zaps our hearts and gives us self-control. We know that's not the case. That doesn't come to a person automatically, but that comes through deliberate, continual choice and consistent behavior. I will be led by the Spirit of God who dwells in me. I will follow the impulses of the Spirit. He is what energizes me. He is, is, is the director of my life now. He is my Spirit. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who dwells, who lives in me, and the child of God is always going to examine Himself in light of the cross, in light of the judgment, in light of the hope of heaven. And then he's going to constantly shift and he's going to reorient his life based upon those things. What Jesus has done, what he promises to do. Isn't that the main difference between believers and unbelievers? Being in control and being out of control. Being led by the Spirit who created this world and who ordered it. And He can make order out of the, our chaotic lives, being led by that Spirit or just being led by our animalistic, fleshly minds. The life of the unbeliever, it's, it's determined and it's manipulated by the Spirit of the world. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to Listen how he says this, the course of this world. It's like headed down a thoroughfare, a highway, a course. 
It's all going to the same place. According to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This is, is characteristic of the life of an unbeliever. Picture his life being a vessel. And, and what, what kind of wind, what kind of air is filling the sails of his life? What's the devil? He's pushing him where he wants him to go. Out of control. Lost at sea. But the man of faith, he's been lifted up to higher ground. As Paul would go on to say here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, he has lifted us, he has exalted us with him, with Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ. And now he lives, and he lives in me, and he decides, and he's the wind that fills my sails, so to speak. So let's give two examples of this. So recognize the hand of the devil, reprimand ourselves, realize our need for self-discipline. Two examples. Paul and, and Martha. If any, if any man had a right, if we, could, if we could maybe say that, if anyone had a right to be discouraged and to be overwhelmed and to, to upset the spiritual balance of his life, it would probably be the Apostle Paul. And yet, some of the most encouraging letters Paul wrote, he wrote from prison. <laughs> Telling the Philippians to rejoice, always. Even though his, his fate is uncertain, even though he might get his head chopped off. Hey, well, if, I, if I die, I'll get to be with Jesus. But if I live, well, then I get to help other people get to Jesus. That's the way he viewed his life. So encouraging. He said to Timothy, one of the very last words of the Apostle Paul, for this reason I also suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What an attitude that is. And then you, you, you contrast that with, with what we have here in Luke chapter 10. Here's Jesus traveling along, and he enters into a village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. How hospitable she is. And she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. So get the picture, okay? Martha's got this rabbi in her house and she is, she's a Jew and she's hospitable and she wants to make a good meal for him. And there's, there's Mary. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? And tell her to help me. Moms, have you ever said that? When you're getting dinner ready and your kid is sitting there watching television or maybe dinner is, is done and there's just a huge pile of dishes and there's, there's your husband just like passed out on the couch, get up off your rear end and help me. That's a reasonable thing. It's not bad. But the Lord answered, Martha, oh, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. Only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. It wasn't that helping Martha prepare the meal was bad. That was a good thing. But we have to choose. We have priorities. This is a, a matter of choice here. And only one thing, in that instance, only one thing was needful. You, 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 you put that one thing at the center. And you allow everything else to fall behind it and around it. And that thing is Jesus. We're capable of doing that. Yes, you have a family. Yes, you're a father. You're a mother. You're a grandmother. You're a child. You're a son. You're a daughter. You have school. You have work to go to tomorrow. You have your health to, to, to consider. You have bills that need to be paid and all of that. That's legitimate you know, areas of life that need to be addressed in their proper way. But these concerns were never meant to be the center of who we are. They were never meant to define who we are. We need to put Jesus at the center and then throw the chips of life up and let them fall around Jesus. Let Him order all of that for you. My primary identity, though I love my wife, is not husband. My primary identity, though I love my children, is not father. 
Though I love my country, it's not American. My primary identity and your primary identity is Jesus, is Christian. You keep him first. And if we could put Jesus at the center, if we keep him at, at the very heartbeat of our lives, then what we're going to be doing is starving the devil of all of those opportunities to, to influence us with worry and anxiety. He can't touch you when you do that. I'm not saying that's easy, but he can't touch you when you do that. That's the full armor that Paul would go on to talk about in Ephesians chapter 6. Now Paul says something rather difficult, I think, one of the hardest commands in the Bible. And he says in Philippians 4, in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's beautiful, isn't it? But there's a command in there. <laughs> and the command is really hard. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Can you do that? Paul expects us to be able to follow that command. Be anxious for nothing. That's, a, that's one of these umbrella terms. It's all-inclusive. And so I want you to look at that verse, and I, I want you to think about what you're going through right now. Everyone's going through something right now, and to different degrees. Whatever your problem is, however overwhelming, however terrible, however powerful it seems to be, and consuming it seems to be, I want you to see that it falls within the scope of this text. Don't let Satan cripple you. Recognize his hand. Reprimand yourself. Realize your need for self-discipline. Let's apply these principles very specifically now with the fear of the future. The fear of the future. We, there's nothing so scary as the fear of the future. I think that's why I don't like swimming in the ocean. Fear of the unknown, right? You don't know what's beneath you. I think I felt something touch my leg. And, yeah, that ruins your whole vacation right there. You're on the beach, at least for me. But fear of the future, fear of the unknown, fear of, of tomorrow. Do you fear that? I think we, I think we do. But it's weird that we, we fear. We're incapable of knowing what's going to happen in five minutes, let alone what's going to happen tomorrow or the next year. Yet sometimes we behave as if we think we do. And we convince ourselves and we fool ourselves with our active imaginations. And we, we, we come up with sometimes the worst case scenario. Some people uh, are, are, have this active imagination. And it, it could be a blessing in one way, but it can also be, it can be a curse. Even, that's the devil. Even the Im imagination. Something that could spark within you to write a song or, or, or to, to write a story. Something beautiful. Satan will want to pervert that, and he'll want to make that a burden in your life. Because when all you can imagine is the worst-case scenario, you're just, you're just crippled by that. The fact is there are infinite possibilities about tomorrow. Some are more likely, and some are less likely. But the devil is going to use the bad possibilities against you. What's going to happen? What kind of evil is going to happen tomorrow in whatever your situation might be? And, and most of them will not come to pass. Most of them will not come to pass. One of my favorite Proverbs, I know the context here is about uh, you know, being a, a diligent worker and not being a, a lazy person, a sluggard, uh, but I think there's, there's a good principle here. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. And the point is, you know, I'm not going to go to work today because I might get eaten by a lion. You know? But do, do you see how the, his active imagination is manipulating him and controlling his life. Sometimes that's how it is with us who, who worry and who are anxious. We, we see a cloud formulating in the, in the sky and we just imagine it getting darker and darker and darker until it turns into a storm. Crippling fear of what might be. But I tell you what the Bible has to say about fear of the future. It's a waste of time. It's a complete waste of time. Your worst fears might never happen. So don't cross those bridges until you arrive at them. 
You live, you know, one thing, you know, Jesus teaches us about little children. There's many, many lessons to learn about little children that we adults need to pay attention to, especially even when they're babies. They take life one square inch at a time. There's, so, there's something to be said about that, about that, that, that childlike trust in their parents. They'll, they'll catch me if I fall. I'm just going to take this one square inch at a time. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Who of you, being worried, can add a single hour to his life? In a sense, it's, he's, he's telling us this is a useless waste of your energy. Don't, don't even bother with it. Because while you're paralyzed with worry, while you're paralyzed with fear about what might happen in the future, you will surely cease to function and be effective today. That's how the devil works. Recognize his hand, reprimand yourself, realize your need for self-discipline. The fact is the devil doesn't control the future. That's not his business. His business is right now. But God does control the future. And let's not allow the devil to work us over and to devour us over mere possibilities over what just might be. He goes on to say, Jesus in the sermon, he says, so do not worry about tomorrow. Don't bother with it. Just be focused on today. He says, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Deal with what's right in front of you. He says, the Gentiles, they're worried about tomorrow about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, this kind of thing. The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. That's how unbelievers live. Those who do not trust in, in, in the control and the power of God. They live only for this world, and they're subject to this world's manipulation, and the spirit of the air is pushing their sails further and further out to sea. There's a word for that. It's slavery. They're enslaved. And Jesus says, if you know the truth, you follow the truth, the truth will set you free. And if the Son frees you, you are free indeed. Fear of the future is a waste of time. Fear of the future engenders a spirit of cowardice, a spirit of slavery, a spirit of death. Knowing what you know about the New Testament, is that the kind of spirit that God has filled you with? Is that the manner of spirit that He has given to us? No, He's given us the opposite. He's given us a spirit of power, of freedom, and of life. Romans 8 in verse 2, the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He goes on to say in verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit of life and freedom, power, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. He goes on to say in verses 12 through 15, so then brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. That's not the wind in our sails. That's not what, what's manipulating and driving and directing our life. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. You will die at, out at sea. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God. These are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, enjoying all of the wonderful blessings that go along with being a son of God. And of course, who can forget the words of Paul? As Paul is writing to discouraged Timothy, anxious Timothy, Timothy in Ephesus, this young man who he left to, to put things in order for the church and to teach the church how to conduct themselves. Things aren't going as smoothly maybe as, as he wants them to go. And Paul says, for this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, that is, of cowardice, a spirit that, that backs away, but of power, love, and discipline. This is God's gift to us. And some of us, me included, are behaving as if we've never received this spirit. Fear. Fear of, of tomorrow. Anxiety. Worry. It denies the work of God in us. 
It quenches that spirit of, of power and love and discipline here in 2 Timothy 1. And the solution is the same solution Paul gave to Timothy. You fan that flame. You kindle that flame of afresh. You remember what God has done for you in the past, what He's doing for you in the present, and what He continues and promises to do for you in the future. Fear of the future is a complete waste of time and engenders the wrong kind of spirit within a person that's going to affect the way he lives. And thirdly, here's where it gets really difficult and uncomfortable, is fear of the future amounts to unbelief. Fear of the future amounts to unbelief. Why do we worry? Why are we anxious? Because we're fools. Because we've forgotten God. The great God of salvation, we've forgotten what He's capable of. We've forgotten His great promises. And, and when, we're, when we're worried, when we're overwhelmed with anxiety, we're, what we're doing is attempting to live outside of His control. Jesus says on that, that same sermon, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing? And he's going to make an argument from the lesser to the greater. Look outside. Look at those birds. You know, they, they, don't, they don't sow. They don't reap or gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much, or worth much more than they? God cares about you more than than a bird, and he takes care of that bird, surely he's going to take care of you too. That doesn't mean that you can sleep in tomorrow and not go to work. But you do what's right, and God will take care of you. And Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 when he sends them out, look, people are, some people are going to accept this gospel message, and some people aren't. And he says to them in, in, in Matthew chapter 10, don't, don't fear men who can kill the body. You fear God who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And as Paul says, of course, in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He would go on to say in the next verse, his purpose for you is to shape you and to make you look like his son Jesus. If we believe this, why are we frightened, brethren? Fear is the evidence of unbelief. And who among us here is not guilty of that? You know, like Peter, we might say at this juncture, increase our faith. Let's believe in the promises of God and trust ourselves to a faithful creator in doing good. There's a, there's a song that I want to share with you. John Newton, he wrote Amazing Grace that's in our, our hymnal. This, this one is not in our hymnal, but John Newton is the same author of this song. Can I read it to you? I will. <laughs> um, it's beautiful. It really encapsulates what we've been talking about today. He says, Be gone. Be gone, unbelief. My Savior is near. And for my relief will surely appear. By prayer let me wrestle, and He will perform. With Christ in the vessel I smile at the storm. Though dark be my way, since He is my guide, tis mine to obey, tis His to provide. Though cisterns be broken and creatures all fail, the word He has spoken shall surely prevail. His love in time past forbids me to think He'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. While each Ebenezer I have in review confirms His good pleasure to help me quite through. How many Ebenezers has God given us? The stone of help that Samuel lifts up and says, Thus far has God brought us, will He not take us all the way home? Yes, He will. Why should I complain of want or distress? Temptation or pain, he told me no less. He promised me this is the way it's going to be until we get to our real home. The heirs of salvation, I know from his word, through much tribulation must follow their Lord. How bitter that cup, no heart can conceive, which he drank right up so that sinners might live. His way was much rougher and darker than mine. Did Jesus thus suffer and shall I repine? 
since all that I meet shall work for my good. The bitter is sweet, the medicine is food. Though painful at present, twill cease before long. And then, oh, how pleasant, the conqueror's song. I'm going to skip some of these verses so we can get to Romans chapter 8 and verse 35 and 39. Cade, you did a wonderful job at reading this. I'm not reading this because you didn't do a good job, just for emphasis sake. Paul ends this wonderful chapter. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If that's true, should we worry? If that's true, should we be anxious about tomorrow? Or should we entrust our souls to a faithful Creator while doing good, just like Jesus did? And we know how it worked out for Jesus. He was exalted. He was lifted up. Close your Bibles. Open up to the Song of Invitation, please. Our time of Bible study is at a close for right now, but I want you to consider some of the things that we've been thinking about today. And don't be crippled with fear. Don't be crippled with anxiety. Give it to God in prayer. And that wonderful blessing we read at the end of Romans chapter 8, that is for only those who are in Christ. Are there any here who are outside of Jesus? Are there any here who, who, who don't have the Spirit of God working in them? Maybe you're being pushed along back and forth, tossed to and fro in the sea of sorrow, in the desert of, of, of sin in this life. Well, Jesus has a message for you. He has come to die for you. He's come to fill you up and to direct your life, but you have to obey Him. You have to trust Him. You have to kneel before Him and, and proclaim Him King in your life. He wants to reign on your, the, the throne of your heart. And He wants you to respond in humble obedience. And He says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And all those wonderful promises that we read about in Romans chapter 8 are yours for eternity. If you want to do that, please come forward and let your need be known as we sing this song.